Okay, good evening everybody and thank you for attending tonight. For you who haven't met me before, my name's Cameron Deal and uh, I'm going to speak to you a little bit tonight about some experiences that we have with real estate. The idea tonight really is for me to be able to give you the ability to go out and go and buy a property on your own. Okay, that's, that's literally what we want to achieve tonight by giving you information that will help you with that process. Basically that will involve how to negotiate at auction, how to buy privately, um, how to establish a set price range and not go beyond it. It can be very emotional buying particularly a home for yourself. Uh, An investment can be a lot more analytical. Okay, so tonight, um, just a bit of housekeeping. We're obviously here just to discuss um, things on behalf of the Bayside Business Network and people that aren't actually um, on that Bayside Business Network, we might want to um, just let you know that it's a great group and this is a part of a 15 seminar series. So if you're not members, please look to become involved in the Bayside Business Network uh, and obviously be in a position to get involved in these seminars and meet a lot more people, particularly if you're in business for networking and hopefully some of those sem seminars like this one will be of interest to you. To give you some insight, I was a building surveyor before I got into real estate. Uh, I got involved in real estate in 1997 and at this stage I probably would have clocked over about two and a half thousand transactions involving representing vendors initially from 1997 to about 2005 before I then got involved in representing buyers. At the time, the reason for that is the lies and misconceptions that I saw as a real estate agent to buyers shocked me. And you'd be really surprised behind closed doors what goes on. So I'm gonna teach you some insights in how you can get around those tricks. Um, but basically the reason I switched and now enjoy and my passion is helping buyers. Uh, our company looks after people that are looking to purchase investment properties and or homes. And if they're looking at selling, we help them with the process of adding value and then selecting the right agent. I've been involved in a lot of media uh, and also have presented on Sky Business News and also have been asked to discuss the Melbourne market on 3AW. So what we're going to oversee and talk about tonight is basically what happened in 2011 what sort of suburbs we as a company recommend. Now, everyone has a different opinion on real estate and where to buy your real estate. Whether you've bought one or a hundred properties, everyone thinks they're a property expert. So I just want to say tonight is my opinion and we focus on this model. Uh, and I'll discuss through the evening why we focus on the model. Uh, however, um, as I say, everyone does have a different opinion on property. Also going to discuss the selection of property and how to select a property that should achieve capital growth. Our company focuses on capital growth before yield. We appreciate that yield is important if you're looking for an investment for your cash flow, but capital growth in the long term will be a lot more relevant than what your yield will uh, if it only costs you an extra 10 or $20 a week to hold it and you see somewhere in the vicinity of 8.4% growth per annum, which is what the Melbourne median is. And that's not even selecting a specialised property, that's actually just the Melbourne median. How to read a contract uh, will also be discussed. How to include special conditions in your favour when you're looking at negotiating. How to submit the most attractive offer. How to negotiate. Um, and why we use different tactics to obviously negotiate property. Now those tactics will obviously help you either whether it's a private sale or an auction. How to bid at an auction or how we bid at an auction and I'll tell you on many occasions we're not successful but we do use strategies and the reason we miss out on quite a lot is that I don't get involved in the emotion of an auction. We establish a price range the day before auction. All of our clients that we represent do not have the ability to tell me on the Saturday that they want, to pay, they want to pay a little more for that property based on what happens during the auction process. So it's very important to establish a price range and be prepared to walk away, particularly based on what's happening in the market at present, which I'll go through in a moment. And what's in store for 2012? 2011 market, basically what we saw was we saw prices in Greater Melbourne come back by 7.5%. So the median value dropped by 7.5%. Some areas a lot higher than that. You would have seen some double digit drops in a lot of those fringe suburbs. 
Greater Melbourne or inner city Melbourne is such, surprisingly, you could have two properties in one street where one completely outperformed and achieved a record result and one 100 metres down the road didn't get a bid. So there were some really unusual things that went on in 2011. We'd go to auctions and think we might have been a chance and then watch it go well beyond us and then we'd go to another one and there'd be no competition whatsoever. So 2011 was very interesting for that reason for us as buyers. Also what we found in 2011 is that the vacancy rates of rental properties increased. We saw it get up into the 3 to 4% range, which is the highest it's been for quite a few years. The selection of property is key there and the areas that didn't perform very well are your new house and land locations where there's an oversupply of property available now for tenants. You've only got to look at some areas in our uh, Greater Melbourne area such as Caroline Springs Point Cook, and I'm not just picking on those suburbs if people live in them, but there was a lot of new house and land package. They all became available at the same time. So what happened is tenants had a choice and they could name their price. So you're looking at something exclusive when you're looking to rent. Dockland, South Bank, despite being convenient locations, there's a development um, aspect to that. And obviously pro-development where the City of Melbourne says, right, we want high density living. We want as many people as we can to live in the city. So again, what happens is multiple two bedroom apartments available in the market, multiple selection, uh, and unfortunately, higher outgoings because of the lifts, pools and gym facilities that those buildings have, which I'll go through with you. So 2011, we saw the market come back. We saw terrific opportunities for buyers, but what happened? Most people left their hands in their pockets. And what that meant was that this, the sophisticated investor had a really good opportunity to get involved in the market and buy well most often. The, the ability that we had last year to negotiate on our terms if the property was unrenovated, we could get access before. Sometimes had to be on license agreement, sometimes not. That gave us the ability to renovate properties before they actually settled them. So those sorts of opportunities became relevant because vendors were very motivated to sell. So 2011, as I said, was one of those years where we saw some of the more affluent suburbs of Melbourne particularly, again, when you were looking at particular types of property and it did depend. And if I look at the weekend's results, for example, to give you an idea, family homes, very strong competition at most family homes where there was some land component to that property that was being sold. Properties below 600,000 in most parts were quite competitive. Properties that sat in the middle between that 7 and 1.2, 1.3, there were some really good buying opportunities if you were looking in those price ranges on the weekend. Um, to give you an idea, we went and attended nine auctions on the weekend. Two sold under the hammer under competition. Two were passed in and sold on the day. The, others five, the other five properties were all passed in and to, as of today, as I've walked into this meeting, are still available. So, Despite the clearance rates improving, it's a tough market for agents and they are still very keen to do deals with you. What are the best suburbs to consider? It really does depend on what you're looking at buying. So I'm going to generalise a little bit here and talk firstly about investment. Um, if you're looking for an investment property, our criteria is this. Established property only. We do not buy brand new or off the plan. Some people will say to me, well, off the plan and, and new property will give you high depreciation. You are correct. But if you're looking at an established property and new property in the same street, you will be able to buy the established property, if I use Elwood for an example, at about 8,000 to 9,000 a square metre. An Art Deco for about 10,000 to 11,000 a square metre. And the brand new project in the same street across the road, you'll be paying anywhere between 14 and 17,000 a square metre. Now brand new projects are clean, neat, everyone likes them because when you walk in they're brand new and everything's new and it feels good. Sad thing is in five years time they'll become established property just like the other ones across the road, just like the Art Decos. So be very mindful, there is no point in paying a premium for a brand new product if you're looking only exclusively for depreciation. The reality is they become established and those established properties continue to grow in value if you buy well. And let me point out that a part of this process and when you enter the market, the buying is the most relevant part of uh, getting involved in real estate. People will talk about property doubles every seven to 10 years and history will show you it does. Even the average properties 
in most part have doubled in seven to 10 years. But not every property. So what you've got to do is make sure your selection is right when you're looking at it. But that's why buying the property and paying the right price when you buy that property is going to give you the start up and the great opportunity ahead. Uh, we have plenty of examples where we've bought property for anywhere between 10 and 15% below market value. 12 months later, our clients have gone and got a new valuation, refinanced, gone and got involved in the market again and been able to immediately use that equity. And that's one of the upsides of property over shares and equity. You can add value outside of market conditions. So the suburbs that we look at buying in are the inner city affluent parts of Melbourne. Most of our activity is through the south and southeast, although we do not ignore the north or the west of the CBD. And if we're looking for value, and our clients generally have a budget, say, up to 500,000, we will probably look at the north and or the west side of the CBD. And we're not adverse to very good one bedrooms, particularly in single female locations. So areas such as Pran, South Yarra and Elwood parts of Carlton North where the Melbourne Uni is, but you don't want to be right in the heart of Carlton. There's an oversupply of apartments being built in Carlton as well at the moment. So, and a lot of those are student accommodation. So the suburbs we'll look at, and I'll go through a few of them. So if we're looking at Elwood, for example, that would be a suburb on the Bay side. We let Middle Park and Albert Park go quite often. Not that we don't like that area, it's just very expensive to get in, and there's not much property available that's below 700, 800,000. Um, so we actively look at going past those areas. Uh, we would look at Elwood. We look at parts of St Kilda, but we're very selective. As we come back in board, we would look at Armidale, Paran, South Yarra, those types of locations. Malvern, Glen Iris are also um, quite attractive to us. Um, so those are the sort of areas that have outperformed over time, particularly Armidale. Armidale, although being one of the most expensive suburbs in Melbourne, is one of the best performing suburbs in capital growth. Over double digit growth, the last 30 years. So every time people say, oh, Armidale's expensive, it's already been seen and you know, everyone's already bought in there and we've seen property prices go up and it's expensive to enter, it's a bulletproof suburb. It keeps performing. People want to live there um, and it's very, very popular with your tenants. So part of the decision when you're looking at investment property is obviously to always make sure that you're actually purchasing a property that's going to be suitable for the person that's going to live there. Look at the demographic. Very important, you aren't going to live in these properties. So look at the demographic of who lives in there and what sort of facilities they need around them to enjoy that environment. Because what you don't want is you don't want to consistently be looking at putting new tenants in every 12 months. It can get expensive with letting fees. So you want to make sure that you've got something where you can hopefully get beyond the market averages and keep tenants in for say more than one year, two years, three years, less turnover, more consistency, better position for you. When we go north and west, we love Elfington, Fairfield, parts of Northcote, Clifton Hill, Fitzroy North, Carlton North. If we're going west, we love Yarraville, Seddon, Williamstown, parts of Newport. But all of these areas, as you can see, are in those cafe cultures where the streetscapes are very, very important, close to coffee shops, personal training studios, pubs, bottle shops, those types of things that tenants like to have near them. Um, so they're the things to consider when you're looking at it. When you look at these uh, areas too, for example, Elwood's one of those anomalies where we find that there is no transport facilities. The only, place, the only thing you can get in Elwood is a bus, unless you're right up the top end of Elwood near Brighton Road, where you can catch your trains and your trams, but still performs. Um, but apart from that, we would normally look at infrastructure that obviously supports people catching public transport, so trains, buses and those types of things. And I can go through this in more detail, I won't get held up here. If you're looking at an investment property and you're looking to achieve capital growth, there are some very important criteria that you should look at. And if you're writing this down, I'll go through it slowly. The property must be a strata title. There are three different forms of ownership of a property. Stratum and company share are the other two options that you can get when you're buying a property. <coughs> the bank would like you to buy a strata title. The bank also wants you to buy residential one. So no apartments above shops or offices, okay, which is obviously now very common on these busy roads. They'll do the shops underneath and they'll put apartments above it. The bank wants you to buy residential one. And I'll go through why they want you to buy it after this. They also, when you're looking at it, uh, want your property to be greater than 50 square metres. Now this will not be 
so important for some of you, but if you're looking at a one bedroom property, it must be greater than 50 square metres in size. Now, the reason for that is that all banks compete in the market for your business if that property is greater than 50 square metres. As soon as you drop below 50 square metres, a lot of banks will pull out and you'll end up with about two or three that will say, yes, we're still considering it. That is the reason why you see a lot of one bedrooms on the market that haven't sold because they sit there because people can't buy them unless they are actually going to put 20% down as a loan on most of those. So your loan to value ratio will be 80%. You're going to have to lock down 20%. Now, a lot of your first home buyers who like those properties don't get the ability to save up 20%. So you're looking at something that's greater than 50 square metres because the future buyer for you is obviously going to need to have that size as well. One of the things that a lot of people forget about when they're looking at buying an investment is who's the future buyer? Because if it's an investor, it's not worth buying that property. The properties that outperform in the market are the properties that actually have interest from owner occupiers. You want to create an emotional environment if you ever put your property on the market and you want investors to compete with owner occupiers. A lot of people love the fact that properties are leased for 10 years and there's a lot of those groups in the market that put support you by saying, well, we're gonna put someone in here, it could be a hotel chain or anyone for 10 years. Owner occupier never touches it. It's always about the numbers. So ensure when you're looking at a property that it's going to be suitable for an owner occupier in future, despite you being an investor or not. Property must be in a quiet residential street. No busy roads. Okay, so leafy, quiet, residential street where people actually want to live. Very important for us because that's where owner occupiers normally want to live in future and it's a quiet street. No one really wants to live on Danny Nong Road where there's eight lanes of traffic and a bus and a tram that runs down the middle. Uh, when you're looking at property, no lifts, no pools, no gyms. And again, as I said, this is my opinion, but in five to 10 years time, these new buildings that have got lifts, gyms, and other facilities, lifts are already costing people money that are bought into these high rise properties. Substantial owners corporation fees with anything that's um, in a high rise. But gyms and pools, they need to be maintained. I don't know how many people have gone into some of these high rises in Melbourne and looked in the gym and seen anyone in there actually training. No one trains in them. No one wants to be sweaty in front of their neighbors. They go off to a gym. So just be aware, those facilities are very expensive. Stay away from them. They will normally take up to about two and a half months of your income, just those facilities alone. So just be mindful of that. Uh, the other sort of features that we look for, must have a car park if it's an apartment and must have outdoor space. Two properties are available at the same time. A tenant will always pick the property that's got outdoor space. So make sure that when you're buying you're looking at outdoor space. Can be courtyard, can be balcony, don't care what it is. Could be big enough just for two people, but having the ability to go outside and actually um, get some fresh air is important. Um, car parking, very important as I mentioned briefly. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? It doesn't matter if it's an open space, a carport or a garage. Uh, just be mindful if it's a garage and it's an Art Deco apartment, good luck getting your car in there. And if you can get your car in there, good luck at opening the doors. Good old horse and cart day. Okay, I'll move on to reading a contract. And if anyone's got any questions, this can be quite interactive. So just pop your hand up and I'll in, uh, interrupt myself and uh, obviously uh, take your question. <laughs> reading a contract and knowing what your rights are. Again, I'll focus um, on apartments first um, because there's more things to consider. But the most important document in a contract of sale outside of the special conditions that a solicitor may include in the contract of sale is the owner's corporation minutes. Okay, so those owner's corporation minutes, if you're buying an apartment, you are buying one of how many are in that building. So if there's 10 in that apartment block, you become a part owner of that whole building and you own one tenth of it, meaning the other nine people have a say over what happens with your apartment. Make sure it's actually got some funds. Make sure you know what they're planning on doing. One of the downsides with buying in an owner's corp also is that structural issues with a building aren't actually going to add value to the apartment. A proactive owner's corp will look at bin corrals, new fences, looking after gardens, common areas. Those things will add value. Changing the roof, underpinning a building, 
those types of things will not add value and they'll cost you money. Everyone expects to buy an apartment in, that's in safe structural sound. So when you're looking at these buildings, uh, when you're looking at these buildings, just make sure that you have read those minutes because they're really important. You had a question? Yes, about off the plan purchases. Yes. Often the owner's corporation hasn't been... Formed, formed. correct. And so there's none of these, so what do you do then? Well, um, the first thing to do is obviously once the, owners are, once the owners are all purchased into the building, they form an owner's corp. So once 75% of the properties are sold, they'll form that owner's corporation for you. All they do is estimate the outgoings. And I've uh, bought, in a, I bought in a renovated Art Deco. I can tell you originally our estimate was 1,200. We knew it was going to be higher than that. It ended up being 2,400 a year. There was a brand new renovated Art Deco apartment internally. So they always underestimate, of course, because they want you to buy it. They want to encourage you in. So they'll say probably about 2,000 a year and it ends up being five or six. And there's no legal way that you can actually go back to them because they do say it's an estimate. There is nothing you can do with a new building. Um, you have to rely on the owner's court being formed. Um, the disappointing thing with a lot of new buildings in Melbourne too is that we find them as rental managers when we're managing those properties, we find them more high maintenance than the established property. There's always something going wrong in a brand new building um, and we spend a lot of time uh, with tradespeople trying to sort that out. Does that answer your question? Great. Any other questions while we move on? No? Okay, so very important to read that part of it. Also, obviously, the other things that are important if it's an apartment is determining it's a strata title, determining that it's residential one, checking what your outgoings are, and then beyond that, uh, obviously, um, looking at things that the uh, solicitor has put in in terms of special conditions. High penalty interest is one that we see quite a lot if you do not settle on a due date. And the amount of bank checks that you may need to provide are probably the more costly things that are associated. So just assess that. One of the things that's in your favour now is that as of March 1, the legislation changed, allowing for you to get legal advice through a solicitor and not just a conveyancer, not to be disrespectful to conveyancers if there's any in the room, but in relation to that, you once, once you got legal advice prior to March 1, you eliminated your cooling off period. As of March 1, you can get legal advice from your solicitor, the agent can be made aware of that, and you still have a three day cooling off period. And the law also now states that the agent can't enforce that you remove that cooling off period. And uh, for the last couple of years, we've seen on many occasions, agents influence us to remove the cooling off period um, so that they could create a competitive environment when there was multiple people bidding for it. So be aware you now have a three day cooling off period. Just be mindful though there are conditions on that, companies and the, the like that are buying in. So just be mindful that you review that before you do it. And if you get advice from a solicitor, you can. Um, if you're looking at a land property where you're actually buying a house, the most relevant thing that we see really is Vic Roads. So ensuring that Vic Roads have no intention of obviously widening the road for you. Uh, but also where easements are, particularly if you're going to develop that site. Uh, one recently that we bought for a client that actually they sourced it themselves. I then um, negotiated the transaction was in Ocean Grove. And to his surprise, he had two easements running down either side of the building and one at the back. There was no way that he was going to be able to develop that site unless he was going to fight with Yarra Valley Water, uh, which was not going, to be, um, not going to be successful for him. So he walked away, but he was about to buy that before he engaged us. It would have been a very expensive mistake on the basis he was going to knock that over and start again. So make, be mindful of your title. The other things that we look for, and I'll go through, that is in special conditions. So these are the conditions that we add all the time to every single contract. Obviously must be inclusive of GST. You'll find in the standard um, REIV contract, which we're members of, that you can put that in there. Uh, it's already a part of the document, but reinforce it. Don't be afraid to just write, when you write your price, inclusive of GST. We also, um, when we look at it, there is a position on the front contract particular page that says what goods are included. Goods being fixtures. They've recently changed the name from chattels and fixtures and all the rest of it. It's now called goods on your contract. It's very important that you write after what goods are included that all of them will be in working order when you settle the property. And I found this out the hard way. Unfortunately, we've had some clients who unfortunately over you know, years and years ago when we first sort of started the business, uh, where we didn't include that and they'd, they'd start the property, they'd buy the property and they'd 
the tenant had moved in and the oven wasn't working. So we now check it and we make sure that when we go to the property and do the pre-settlement inspection before settlement, is we make sure that all of those facilities are working. So that means the power must be connected and the gas must be connected. A lot of people who have moved out turn it off. So you either ask whether you can connect it yourself prior to or ensure that it's left on. The other thing that we often ask for, particularly for our investors, is we ask for access 21 days prior. But you can even use this if you're looking at renovating as well, because it means you can get tradespeople through. So we, are, we put a special condition that we have access to the property 21 days prior to settlement. And we do that on the basis of being able to start showing that property to tenants. Meaning that literally every time we have settled the property, we've got a tenant ready to move in from the first day. You're not looking for two to four weeks for a tenant after you settle, therefore losing $1,600 to $2,500, $3,000 of rental income that you could have got. Go ahead. Are they legal, legally obliged to give you the 21 days? Uh, if you write it on the contract, they are. If they sign it, yep. They're not, they don't have to accept the condition. I've only ever had it knocked back two times in about 600 transactions. Yeah. <clears throat> Keep in mind, we might have to be a bit flexible where their agent has to be in attendance at the opens, um, but every time they'll accept it. It really, we're not really, da we're not, not doing any damage to it as such. So all we're really doing is allowing the doors to be open and people come through. Um, thankfully, a lot of the properties we buy may or, may or may not be already vacant, but we don't often have any trouble with it. And if you're going to hold your ground on it, that'd be one that we hold our ground on. Um, we don't budge on that. The other thing, obviously, that's become relevant in the market, does that, sorry, does that answer your question? You okay with that? Yep. Um, the other thing that's become um, prevalent in the market is 5% deposit rather than 10. Don't be afraid to ask for 5%. Better in your bank account getting interest rather than sitting in a trust account. Uh, you will not get it every time. Okay, if it's a competitive auction environment or a private sale and there's multiple people, I would stick to the 10%. Okay, do not make the vendor nervous if you're looking to buy something. Just stick, leave it to the 10%. But if you're on your own and you know it, 5%. That's the offer. Go ahead. Do you, do you uh, ask for that during the auction process? Before. Before the auction. Before right. the auction. So either get it done before the auction on the Friday that you're, you're, you're intending on bidding, but you're intending on bidding on the basis of this, this and this. So we always confirm that on the fr Thursday or the Friday beforehand where we'll say, we're bidding on the basis that we've got access, it's 5% deposit, inclusive of GST, and we put all the conditions that we want. Yep. What about removing the properties that already have tenants in there? Do you do that much? Yeah. Uh, oh, look, if, they, if we buy a property and there's tenants in there, that's great, it's terrific, yeah. Obviously saves everybody um, some headaches if there's someone in there, particularly if they're paying the right amount. But just be careful. One of the things that we look for is that we look at market rent. Um, a lot of people, particularly this happens a lot more in commercial property where there's a rental amount being paid, but it's well in excess of market. And next cycle, they don't get that number. So just be conservative, despite that there's a tenant in there paying an amount of money. So if it's 400 a week, maybe do your numbers to see if it works at about 370 to 380. Okay, and I'm not saying that you might have someone in there paying too much, but just, be, just look at that um, because the security isn't there uh, if they move out. So 5% deposit, one of the things we also uh, ask for. Access beforehand, goods in working order. They're some of the most important things. I don't play with the penalty interest. Okay, I'll leave it as is. I don't want to make the vendor nervous that they think that I may not settle on the due date and therefore I want to change the um, amount of penalty interest that will be paid if I can't settle. So I leave that as is. The other area of the contract you must read is the special conditions. I can't tell you what they'll be, um, but when they are special conditions, just make sure your solicitors had a good look over those because there's certainly going to be some things that may need to be changed. Uh, and they differ from every contract. Putting those conditions on your contract should not put you in a non-competitive position, okay? 5% might, but the other conditions shouldn't really put you in a non-competitive position. If they are, the vendor will ask for it, so the, the agent will ask for it via the vendor, but uh, it should not put you in a position where if there's another offer on the table that they're going to look at uh, disregarding yours because of those conditions. You don't want to be looking at putting building inspections and subject to finance. With the cooling off period, get your building inspection within the three days. And if you can't, 
ring me because I've got people that could do it for you in three days. Okay, so you've got three clear business days and that is from the time you sign the contract, not the vendor. So from the day you sign is when the three clear days starts. So if the vendor takes two days to respond, you've got one day left. One of the other things to eliminate that problem is put a deadline on your offer every single time. We call it a sunset clause. We give the vendor, depending on the situation and how much competition we think we might have, a maximum of 24 hours to get back to me. The shortest has been two hours. Where I've said, you've got two hours. We knew exactly what was happening. We were being played by an agent. So we made it very clear that they had two hours to respond, otherwise we were walking away. Also, when you're looking at negotiating, one of the things we put on our contracts, um, sorry, prior to putting it on our contract, is we, we advise the agent this is our highest and best offer every single time. And at that time, it is true. It is my highest and best offer. It may not be an hour later, but at that time, that's my highest and best offer. You need to hold your ground here. If they can sense that there's some weakness, they know you've got more money. So you need to be very, very firm. And that's where your market knowledge comes into it. And you need to know what that property is worth when you're looking to buy it. How to submit the most attractive offer. The best way to get the best outcome for you is to get the agent on your side. That takes market knowledge, of course, as I've already mentioned, but most importantly, the mistake a lot of buyers make is that they, they will pay, on 70% of occasions, they will pay what the agent selling and representing for the vendor price. So when you read a quote, a lot of people will say it's 650 to seven, okay, well, it's obviously worth something in there. I might pay just a bit over that so I can secure the property. Property could have been worth 550. So make sure you have the knowledge before you go into bat. But what you need to do is you need to make sure that agent is going to actually influence the vendor to take the offer. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be at the range. You just need to find out where that breaking point is. And what we do there is that we will often say that our client only has this amount of money for this property. We've spoken to their finance out. We cannot get any money. Is it worth submitting an offer? Immediately you'll find out whether that offer is going to be a chance or not. You haven't offended the agent. You haven't told him that the property's not worth what he's asking. This is all my client's got. And that's what you can try yourself, is that this is all we've got. This is our budget. So it's very difficult at times because over a period of time, if you miss some properties and you create a relationship with an agent, they get to know what your budget is. That's why sometimes it's better to have us on your team because we obviously don't advise them. And if we do, we've changed our mind or we're looking elsewhere, or we've shortlisted this one property, uh, sorry, shortlisted two or three properties, but this is the one we like the most, so we're gonna negotiate on this first. So there's different language you can use, but find out where that agent is going to sit down with a vendor and say, this is a good offer and you should take it. Okay, because if you get that, if you get that agent on your side, your chances of getting it are a lot higher. So just make sure when you're doing that, you look to what the agent is looking for in terms of price. Negotiating to buy. Negotiation is um, a skill, and most importantly, this skill is actually going to um, work in your favour if the property has gone to auction and it's passed in. That's where it gets emotional. These are a couple of things that we do. Do not go inside if the property is passed into you. I can tell you right now, if you sit down inside on someone's lounge suite and get comfortable, there'll be competition outside. There's always someone outside who wants to buy this property if you don't. We always put ourselves in the position of having first right of refusal at the vendor's reserved price. To get that, you have to bid. I don't care what you bid, whether you're throwing a thousand dollars, whatever it might be, but give yourself the control position. Give yourself the first chance of saying yes or no. It does mean that if you don't pay the reserve, the agent is in a position where they can go and talk to other people. But don't ask if you can negotiate either. Because as soon as you ask the question, can I negotiate at that price? More money, you got more, I'm gonna negotiate, I'll come back. 
Keep in mind that every single agent will come back to you with an inflated reserve. Probably want 950 and you've been told they want a million and 20. Somewhere in the middle is about the range. Happens nearly every time. So just be mindful that when you're looking to negotiate, there's always going to be some negotiation room. Rarely, rarely does an agent come back and say what the number is that they're going to take. And there might be people that might disagree with me, but we see that all the time. So just when you're looking at that, um, just make sure that when you're looking to negotiate, stay outside. It's one of our skills that we do. We look to make sure there is no competition. We know we're in the control position if we're outside. I don't want to get comfortable. The other thing too is that you've established your budget. You know exactly what you're prepared to pay for that property. So what you're doing under negotiation is don't get emotional. Don't let the agent convince you it's worth more at that point. Um, it's very important to stick to your number. Be prepared to walk away. And one of the, word, or one of the um, terms that we use is that's our walk away price. We're walking away if they don't accept that price. And guess what we do? We walk away. It has worked against me. Most of the time it works for me. There will always, always be another property. And I know that that can sometimes be hard when you've found the dream house and all of a sudden uh, you've got one person, either one of you, if it's a couple, saying that we want that house. There will always be another one. You've established your budget, you've got your stretch price, you've got your walk away price, stick to the number. All right? So, and don't get divorced over it. But just make sure that you, you know, you're firm at this point because these terms will mean that that agent all of a sudden has the belief that you know what you're doing and you're in control. Uh, and as soon as they are aware that you're in that position, they're less, they're less likely to let you walk away and more likely to try and get you to sign a contract. But you've got to be prepared. And we often have started walking. We've been chased up the street because we've actually walked and they didn't think we would. The difference with us is that we get paid a set fee. We're not a commission of the purchase price. So I have no interest in convincing you to pay more money. Most of my competitors will charge you a commission of the purchase price. We're a set fee, whether you're buying at 600 or 700 for an investment, and a set fee whether you're looking at a home. Okay, so I've already, I'm in a position where I'm quite comfortable. I don't care if I get that property or not. It's a transaction for me. I don't get emotional about it. I'm getting it for the best price. I need you to go off and talk to other people. So when you're negotiating, there the, they're a couple of terms that we highly recommend you look at using. It's our highest and best price. It's our work, walk away price. And if they come back with a higher number, turn around. Start walking towards the door and see what happens. I guarantee you 99% of the time that agent will not let you leave that property. Particularly if it's been passed into you and no one has bid. Sometimes it's good to show a little bit of room and movement room and, and in good faith I'll give you a bit more, but make sure that you're in control. As soon as you see that agent chase you, you know exactly what position you're in. How to bid at auction. Now this varies depending on the type of property, how much interest there is and what price range it's in and most importantly what your budget is. Okay, if I feel that we're in a position where we've got a conservative budget on a property, I'm in, strike, I'm in the strike zone, but I think the, the budget I've been given is a bit conservative, I will start aggressively. And I use that strategy on the basis that hopefully it intimidates some people to not get involved, and this guy's going to buy it under any circumstances not knowing that I have a budget just like they do every single time. And it's one of the things uh, you should understand when you're at an auction. All buyers advocates, despite how intimidating they might be and what games they play, have a budget. Not often do I get told, buy it under any circumstances. I think in my whole career of buying property, I've had it about four times. Uh, and I actually don't like bidding under those circumstances. But putting all that aside, one of the things to do is we start aggressively. We do that because we know at the end, if I haven't intimidated people and got them out of the competition, I'm not going to go buy that property. Alternatively, if I don't think there's any interest, I won't do a thing. Right up until the point where it's going to be passed in. Then I might throw in a bid. 
And when I throw that bid in, I'm throwing that bid in on the basis that I want to negotiate, but I'm also doing it right at the death knock. I wait until that property is literally going to be passed in. Okay, and I mean within milliseconds. So I know at that point, no one else is going to bid for this property. I guarantee you, I'll do it later than you. Most people we know will do it probably on first count, second count. Don't, don't give yourself a chance to find out whether you've really got competition. I will leave it until it's about to go on the market passed in, okay? That's how close it is. Also, if it's on the market, I might also leave it to that point too. So when you're bidding, if you don't have a budget, idea is to probably start a little bit higher if you think the property's worth a little bit more than what you can get to. If you're in the range and you think you're going to be a chance, no point rushing the process. No point getting, adding emotion to the auction. No point building it all up for the auction here. Make him work. Make him work for your bid. Because once you make him work, you can obviously then um, decide when you get involved in it. The other thing that we do, which is really important, is never bid on fives and zeros. I'll give you an example. If the property is worth 560, I might open the bidding at 491. I might then go to 502, I might then go to 513, 519, 526. I am all over the place. I do not listen to the auctioneer. I do not wait for him to tell me that I can bid fives or tens. I'll decide when I want to change it. I might drop the bidding to $1,000 as fast as I can so I know the increments can be 1,000 and then jump it by 12. I'm going to play around. I'm going to try and bamboozle my competition to the point where they go, I don't know what's going on here and they get lost. So just be aware, don't end on, a, don't end on an even number at auction. Always have that extra one or two. The amount of properties that I've bought with that extra 1,000 would blow you away. Probably, probably last year about 15 to 16 properties last year just because of that one extra thousand dollar. But importantly, don't just keep going based on what the auctioneer tells you, fives, 550, 555, 560. Play it around. Why are you playing in his hands? He wants you to do that. You do what you want to do. He should be blessed that you're actually bidding for his property. Um, the other thing that we do uh, is that I will assess my competition before we even start. Do not stand at an auction with your arms crossed. Do not overdress. Do not invite your family. They are the three things that every single time I see, I go, definitely competing. Definitely competing. Now, it might not make a difference to the price, but I know who my competition is. I know where to stand. I know exactly what to do to make sure I can see exactly what they're doing at different times. I can see when they're starting to talk because they're getting to their limit, because they haven't communicated effectively before the auction. I know I've got them. I'm this close to beating them now because they've started talking. So there are things that you should and shouldn't do. One of the things that we do is we stand with the real estate agent. I'm in a suit. Confuses every buyer when all of a sudden the person who they thought was selling the home is bidding for it. <laughs> Don't be afraid to you know, look at standing and communicate with the real estate agent. I face the crowd. I don't be one of the crowd facing towards the agents. I look at the crowd. I want them to know that when I'm bidding, I'm, I mean it, I'm bidding. So I'm there to try and intimidate. I do not talk to people. I don't walk up and down. I don't do anything silly like that, but I don't ask questions either. Don't ask questions. Get your answers beforehand. As soon as you ask a question, everyone knows you're going to bid or someone on your team's going to bid. So we never ask a question. It doesn't intimidate anyone out. If you're there to ask a question, it means you're there to buy it yourself. And you're just trying to put people off. So I've never seen it work in all my years. Um, so there's some of the things to use and if you want any more advice on that and hopefully I've given you some ideas on what you can do next time, um, they're the things to look at. Your rights after you purchase. I've told you about the three day cooling off period. With your special conditions, if you choose to put a uh, subject to building or subject to finance or anything where there's, a, where there's a time period after the purchase date, put either a price. So the REIV standard clause for a subject to building inspection is based on you can withdraw if there's a major structural defect. What does that mean? What's a major structural defect? I've got no idea what it means and I've been in this business for 15, 20 years. I was a building surveyor beforehand. I still don't know what a major structural defect is. Put a price. Anything beyond $5,000 in value of defect with that property, I can pull out. No penalty. 
Because if you pull out of a contract after you've purchased it, within the cooling off period, the agent is in a position where they can retain your, a part of your deposit, it's 0.02% or $100, we all know it's going to be 0.02%, um, whichever is the greater is the amount that they can keep. Most agents don't keep it, but some will, particularly if you've upset them. So when you do a condition, put a deadline on it and put a monetary value if it's required. And that will put you in a much stronger position when it comes to withdrawing from that sale. Do not leave it open for yourselves. Make sure you've got it locked in all of the conditions are correctly worded so that you can pull out without penalty. Apart from that, once you have signed a contract within three days, particularly for an auction, sorry, th within three days before or three days after the advertised auction date, no cool off. Lose your deposit. It's pretty much how it would work. Or you've got to try and sell it before your settlement date and risk having a double stamp duty position if you don't know the new purchaser particularly if you sell it for more, you'll always cop a double stamp duty. Don't put yourself in that position. So make sure all your due diligence is done before the three days or after the three days. Now that everyone has a cooling off period, a lot of agents will not want to sell their properties before auction. It's going to be a problem we're going to see shortly. We've already started seeing it where if we want to make an offer on a property before auction, um, that, uh, that vendor and the agent knows that I can pull out three days later. A lot of people aren't going to risk a five, $7,000 marketing campaign to risk you walking away. It also means that buyers can be a little cheeky now. I can make an offer on a property of 650000 worth 550 kill the market. They've got to start quoting it at 650 plus. I withdraw my offer three days later, just before the auction. Um, and we've got a poor vendor who's in a position who thought they were going to get 650, got all excited. No one turns up at the auction in the end. Uh, and obviously it sells for a lot less or it doesn't sell at all. So there's a lot of games that will be played now. We're not a fan of the legislation change. Uh, it was much better when there was a position where I could decide as a buyer whether I wanted to offer the three day cooling off period to the vendor or withdraw it completely. Uh, as of today, I can't offer withdrawing the cooling off period. It was a very competitive position for us as buyers. If I knew my competition was offering the three days and I wasn't, I was obviously in a really strong position and often meant that I built, I actually purchased those properties for our clients at less than potentially what my competitors were offering. That's going to be an issue that's going to come up and we're going to see complaints about that shortly. Um, so basically mining centres. Frankston was extremely topical for a period of time as well because the bypass road was going in. It was going to mean I was going to get to the city five minutes faster. Be really careful about those. There is no infrastructure. It is based on one industry. And when that industry, if it ever shuts down, that property you've bought is not worth anything. So it's really important. The more infrastructure around you, the better your investment will perform in a rental sense. If you are looking for yield, which we still encourage our clients to do because capital growth properties, you'll get to a certain point and you've got to stop buying because you can't afford to keep anymore because it's going to be a negative position. Then you can speculate. Once you've bought a couple, you've got a good base, you can speculate and look for opportunities outside. But get a good base. It's the same when we recommend to our clients to look at commercial properties. Get a good base of residential because your vacancies will be longer with commercial. So establishing that base first and growing from that, because the sad thing is that we often see people that have actually bought the wrong investment, sell their better investments to support the bad investment. Don't put yourself in that position. Get your base, get your buffers in line, make sure you can afford to keep it. Because when you're buying property, you've got to keep it for seven years as a minimum, in my opinion. Okay, now, there were the times when you could buy something and two years later, 203, 204, you got the ability to obviously get growth quickly and you could on sell. Um, but make sure you're keeping it for a cycle period, which we historically see as being seven years, where you should see your property at least be 50% more than what you paid for it. It will not happen every time and the selection of the property is important. Matthew. Is commercial property as well? No. No, we have people that we would refer you to if you're looking at commercial. 
Uh, nothing wrong with commercial, by the way. Uh, it's actually um, got some significant benefits if you buy the right commercial property, but you don't want to find something that sits vacant for six to 12 months. Uh, when you mentioned 50 square metre minimum, yep. is that internally or externally? Uh, great question. Uh, some valuers will consider outside walls because the strata title includes your walls. Others will measure from the inside. I can't tell you, all banks have a different philosophy on it. Um, we make a decision that it has to be internal so we get beyond that. Other banks include storage cages and car parks in the 50 square metres. Um, very, very dangerous. Bank West was doing it for a long time. I think they might have stopped doing that now because it meant that student accommodation could be considered. Uh, so 50 square metres internal, be safe. Okay, um, so basically for the rest of 2012, we see that the market will stay somewhat stable. A lot of economists all over the place will tell you that we're in a inflated market. Maybe we are. One of the great things about property is everyone's got to live under a roof. Okay, and when there's oversupply, that's when you see problems. We've also got a really good banking culture. Despite our dislike for banks, the structure is very safe and sound. Most of us have to obviously ensure that we've got a deposit, whether we're using equity or whether we're using savings, uh, we're putting a deposit down. The reason I went through that model structure before Strata, residential one, greater than 50 square metres, is because the bank in future, if you're developing and growing a portfolio, will look at that asset as an A-grade asset. As soon as you start playing around with those criteria that the banks like, they start saying they want you to retain a higher LVR position, meaning that you can never gain access to that money. It sits in that investment and that could be 10%, 20%, 30%, depending on what you're buying. Now, if you've got to leave 20% in it and you could have used 10% of that 20, it gives you a position to buy another one if you can service it. So, be aware that that's what a good asset will do and that's why the banks like that criteria. Uh, and I can go through that in more detail with you. These are some examples of some of the properties that we have purchased in the past. This is in Edgerton Road, Armadale, as it says there. That's a block of 10. These two buildings here were actually built afterwards and it was originally just a block of eight. They obviously, as you can see, kept it in keeping with the rest of the building. This goes against what everyone thinks about established property. The depreciation on this property was $120,000. Fairly significant for a $550,000 apartment. So what I'm saying is don't fall in the mindset that if you buy new and or off the plan, that's the only way to get depreciation. That was built in the 70s. That was renovated three years ago. A client's got $120,000 out of that one and the capital growth of a quiet residential street in Armadale in a block of 10. No lifts, no pools, no gyms. Three levels, which is our maximum. Outdoor space, as you can see, car parking at the back, security. S jury's still out on whether I like Rendor or not. Rendor can, render can hide things when you're buying. So cracks in buildings can be hidden quite easily with Render. Uh, in this instance, we were fairly comfortable that it was okay. Um, also, what you'll find with render is that when there is a crack in the building, it quickly is shown. So you've got owners' corpse that have to go back and patch and paint cracks in walls. Uh, and if they don't paint the whole building, you can see where that patch is and we can very quickly tell that there's been a crack in the building. Art Deco. Locations in Melbourne, it is very, very desirable to look for an Art Deco property. Uh, Hawthorne, Hawthorne East. Elwood, St Kilda. Recognised for its Art Deco architecture. Surprisingly what people will pay for this architecture because you will often find the accommodation is not as good as your 1970s apartments or 60s. Um, normally smaller, normally a bit dysfunctional. There's a kitchen miles away from a living room. The second bedroom's often small. They have no storage, but there's some romance. And romance adds 10, 15%. So when you're looking at Art Deco, uh, be mindful that um, you're still looking at particular criteria. This was a strata title, uh, elevated position. We purchased the top floor front position here. Unfortunately, this was one of those auctions where my client said buy it under any circumstances. And we paid quite a bit of money for that, but it was a very competitive auction. And there is no doubt that in seven to 10 years time, that property will be worth twice as much as what we paid if history is any indication.
that for rental? You buy an Art Deco, or only if you were wanting to live in it? Um, based on what you say. Both. Your yield will be a lot less for an Art Deco. Uh, because you were paying a premium despite the accommodation not being as good as some of those 1970s apartments. But uh, in a growth sense, they've consistently outperformed. Um, and areas, particularly Elwood, um, just, um, just, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of properties, that's what the market comes to.